Welcome this morning. Uh, it's great to see everyone here. Uh, there's some other seats for people who are standing at the back. Let me start off by uh, thanking uh, Sean Le Pen, who's sitting at the back. Sean, will you stand up? And his team. We wanted to kick it off with that short video because I think it embodies a lot of the energy and the uh, foresight and the, um, as Sean said, uh, the willingness to take some risks. And if you're going to fail, fail quickly, move on, learn. Uh, and that's sort of part of the spirit that we want to uh, engender at the university, uh, university wide and not just in, in, in specific pockets. So we thought that was a good uh, way to kick off this morning and, uh, and sort of set the, uh, the tone for the day. Right, we're all relaxed, we're all uh, trying to uh, examine uh, interesting ideas uh, and we have to be prepared to take some risks and prepared to deal with failure. Um, I wanted to start off with this slide. This is a slide that we've used uh, several times uh, because, uh, you know, we have to keep reminding why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, we're not raising revenue for the sake of raising revenue. Berkeley's not a corporation. Uh, we're an education institution. And above all, uh, we seek to um, be as good as we can at teaching, research, and public service. That's the overarching miss mission of Berkeley. And nothing that we're discussing today is at variance with that. Um, that that uh, ultimate goal is supported by two strategic uh, pillars or aspirations of providing comprehensive excellence and access to as many students as possible and to our researchers. Now, those two pillars can't stand and supply the uh, raw material we need to do teaching, research, and public service unless they're on a very stable foundation, and that foundation is financial stability. And that requires uh, us to be both efficient and to raise revenue and to be organizationally uh, well organized. So I want you to keep that picture in mind uh, because um, it's, it's, it cuts to the chase. It's what we are pursuing, when we're pursuing net revenue, we are not pursuing it for its own sake. We're pursuing net revenue so that we can use resources to support the mission of Berkeley. So that is important, it's key. So today, uh, there's three sessions. Uh, I'm going to kick it off with a little bit of the big picture in terms of uh, why we need to focus on uh, raising additional revenue. Uh, and what are the uh, ways that uh, it will help us. Then I'm going to ha hand over to Andrew. Uh, Zeri, who's going to talk about uh, more specifics of the role of the, op of the Operational Excellence uh, Program Office and how that is being transformed to supply additional assistance and being an enabler for generating revenue. And then we're going to have an interactive session uh, where we have some fun. Again, I would go back to that first video and think about how that uh, sort of brainstorming uh, led to that particular project. So that's the agenda for today. Um, so why revenue and why now um, is pretty straightforward, right? We've shown this graph many times. You know, this is the tragic uh, trajectory of state investment at Berkeley. Uh, it's declined by 58% um, in real dollars over the last seven or eight years. It's declined from being 28% of our revenue to roughly 12%. Uh, it's a massive change. Um, it's a reality that we're in. It, there's nothing in the governor's budget and looking forward that causes us to think it's going to change. Uh, we can argue against it, which we will. Uh, the probability that we're successful in reversing it in any meaningful way is very small. Um, so it's a reality that we have to deal with. Now, Berkeley's done an incredible job in dealing with it. As this graph shows, uh, we've been very successful at raising other sources of revenue. Many have heard me say before, every one of the last 10 years, Berkeley's total expenditures and total revenue have increased. Right? Berkeley has not been in decline. And it's increased because all the other sources of revenue, the 88%, have grown at a faster pace than the state has disinvested. So what we're doing today is, is nothing that we haven't done as a campus already. All we're trying to do is scale it up and to push it further into the institution. So we're already, uh, from an operational budget point of view, uh, not dependent on the state to anywhere near the degree that we were in the past. Right? We get 88% of our money from somewhere else, not the state. Uh, and so we are more robust in that sense. 
and we can't afford to be passive. Because as I will show in the next slide, uh, looking ahead, many of the uh, traditional revenue sources for Berkeley are under stress. If we, um, I don't know if there's a pointer on this thing. No. So if we, if we look at this uh, pie chart, it simply breaks down uh, the major revenue sources for Berkeley into large segments. And if you think about state support, the, the um, 283 million uh, is one segment, and we have a fairly good idea that that's going to be increasing at a very s slow rate, even if the governor's budget gets adopted. One issue is that he, uh, the governor and the legislature may link the slight increase in state support with freezing tuition and fees. We already know that if you freeze tuition and fees, uh, then Cal and Pell grants will remain at the same level. And then we also know that federal C&G, which is contracts and grants, all the research money we get in state and private contracts and grants, are unlikely to increase given the sequester on what's going on in Washington. So if you look at that pie chart from tuition through federal, through other contracts and grants and state support, that part of that pie is unlikely to increase at a very rapid rate, very small increase in that part. That's 72% of our revenue stream. So that only leaves 28% uh, that we have to play with in terms of expanding uh, revenue coming to Berkeley. The point I want to emphasize is that we have to be active in every part of that pie. And it's one of the things that we'll emphasize. We don't want to give up in any one of those segments, um, but we have to um, put a lot of energy in growing the other two segments of the pie uh, to make the, the books balance. And again, we put this one in twice because having said all that about the revenue thing, you know, why does it matter? It matters because uh, Berkeley is one of the preeminent public universities in the world. It's a place that other public universities benchmark themselves against. So in, in making Berkeley sustainable, we do more than just serve Berkeley. We serve the whole uh, system of public education in America, if not the world. So it has far-reaching implications even beyond our own campus. Our own campus and university is worth making this effort for in and of itself but it has broader ramifications, and we can't take our eye off the reason that we're doing it. Now, you know, uh, we already have a tremendously uh, successful program in terms of increasing efficiency. Uh, we're about three years into the program. Andrew Zeri heads up the uh, operational excellence effort for us on campus, and we went into that program uh, with uh, a number of large projects identified uh, and with the intention of uh, investing about 75 million in total uh, for uh, savings of 75 million per annum, uh, which would be an amazing return on investment. Uh, we are uh, into the third year of that. We're on track in terms of uh, the investments we've made, and I think cumulatively we've um, generated savings around $60 million or close to that number. So that program is going well. But that program uh, focuses uh, exclusively on efficiency and cost saving. Uh, what we're now moving into is to think about how do we uh, also throw into the mix generating net revenue? Because it's a simple concept that a dollar saved is equal to a dollar of net revenue generated. At the end of the day, they're the same. They freeze up resources and we can spend it to support the mission of Berkeley. So we want to expand uh, the, um, the remit of the OE project, uh, program office, and Andrew will be talking about that effort. Now, we have four other uh, big areas uh, where we are generating revenue, and, or trying to, and it comes back to that pie chart that we're not giving up on any segment of it. Uh, I won't go into any one of these in detail, but we're working very closely with Graham Fleming and the other people who are doing all of the work on contracts and grants, research, patents, innovation, and licensing to see if we can really ramp up our efforts. Berkeley doesn't benchmark well in this area. We're not as bad as some people think, particularly if you take out the medical score, which we don't have. Um, but even if you adjust for that, Berkeley doesn't score well in research, in monetizing some of the research we do, and we think we can generate a significant return from investment in that. Philanthropy, we do remarkably well. 
Uh, you know, Berkeley, I think, is, is the seventh or sixth in the nation uh, last year in, in raising philanthropy. But we know that we could do better. There's certain aspects where we've underinvested and uh, we want to ramp up our efforts in philanthropy. Online and Richmond Bay Campus, we think both of them could be revenue opportunities. We think both of them are very long-term efforts. We're working very hard on both. We have a steering committee on online strategy. Uh, you know, and it ranges from serving public purpose to uh, improving the uh, uh, teaching on campus to eventually accredited courses that we may uh, generate revenue from. So there's a spectrum of activities on online and, and we're going to work on that. And then Richmond Bay Campus, as you know, we have that large piece of land. We teamed up with Lawrence Berkeley Labs. Um, it's two thirds the size of our existing campus. It's a big piece of land and we're very... Uh, enthusiastic and I and, uh, think there are tremendous opportunities in developing that into a uh, partnership with uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs and some other entities where we could generate significant revenue. Think of Stanford's research park. So, you know, there's, there's big opportunities there. Obviously, that's long term. So today, though, we're focused on, on this last uh, element, which is the unit level entrepreneurship where all of you, we hope, uh, will help us uh, work on projects that would generate revenue uh, almost entirely for your own unit's benefit. Uh, the idea here is that the more money you can generate at your level, which is in a way that, and I keep coming back to it, consistent with our mission, values, and purpose at the unit level, the better off we all are because it frees up resources for us to spend on other activities where it's impossible to generate revenue. So today we're really focused on this box here. Um, this is a nice quote. I won't r read it out. Um, one way I was thinking about was uh, when we were thinking of doing this, um, uh, I think it was Peggy, someone asked me to say, well, what does this look like in your mind in five years' time? Uh, so if we fast forward to uh, 2018, what does this look like? In my mind, what this looks like is that we've spent, we've invested, I would say, roughly $45 million, $50 million dollars in new projects on this campus. Um, we have had uh, five projects that have already uh, reached fruition and have repaid all the capital if they took loans. Um, we have five more projects that will come to fruition in a couple of years. And we've got about another eight projects that are in the pipeline being implemented. Uh, importantly, we've got th two or three projects that have failed and we've closed them down. Uh, and we've generated about 80 million in additional revenue for net revenue for Berkeley per year. That's where we are in five years' time. Uh, and we've already reaped about 30 million in savings, so, or in net revenue. So, um, you know, that's the sort of scale of, of what we're aiming to achieve is something in the ballpark of uh, investing 40 million, generating 80 million, maybe 15, 20 projects. Uh, and being prepared to see a couple of them fail, and if they fail, we, we close them down. So that's my sort of vision. That's the speech I'll be giving in 2018, if I'm still here. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we wanted to give a very quick example of a project that uh, sort of s set uh, some of the uh, objectives for this type of uh, endeavor and we've used uh, one that is up and running and is, is sort of fully operational. Comes from, this one happens to come from uh, intercollegiate athletics. Uh, it was a bit led by um, Sandy Barber and um, Solly and the team. Uh, so what was that it, it, uh, effort? So just a very quick summary because there's, there's a much longer presentation on this project. Uh, we like using it because it's real. Uh, and it showed entrepreneurial spirit, and we were able to pull it off. Uh, Solly and the team came. They had a business proposal. Let's establish a more professional uh, capacity to do outbound sales of tickets to athletic events. Uh, he had a business plan, a very detailed funding, uh, estimate of costs, what were the deliverables, how much revenue and return on investment he expected if we implemented it correctly. The big uh, roadblocks were where were we going to get the money? Uh, how could we create a performance-based uh, compensation scheme? And um, what is the type of process 
and structure we needed in order to implement the project. On the, on the identify funding sources, we were lucky in that um, we could uh, tap into an existing pool of money in our endowment, uh, whereby the donors had just uh, indicated they wanted it used for entrepreneurial activities. And I was at the meeting and I said, could we use that money? And they agreed. On the HR aspect, we worked very closely with Janine Raymond and found a way of um, incentivizing the type of staff that this effort requires uh, that was consistent with our HR policy. And we did that. We did both those things in about 10 days. So from the time when Solly brought the proposal, in 10 days we, we, we had the funding and we had the HR policy. And then he went forth and implemented it. And this is the results uh, just this past 12 months. So if you look at ticket sales uh, before we set this unit up and ticket sales afterwards, you know, we've, we, it cost us uh, nearly $400,000 to hire the staff to incentivize them and put in the software and the hardware that they needed. And we've seen a jump in ticket sales of about 1.8 million. So ballpark number, this is like a 395 internal rate of return on our investment. Uh, so that's the benchmark that you all have is 400% return on investment. Uh, but you know, this is a real example. I mean, this, you know, there's slight exaggeration in this because there are other things going on apart from the, uh, from the group that we set up. So attribution is a bit of a problem. Um, but there's no doubt that we were a lot better off having done that. So I wanted to end with that example. And now I'm going to hand over to Andrew, who's going to take us through uh, some of the more of the specifics on uh, what the OE project office intends to do.